1, Ephesians in chapter number 1. We sang a song a moment ago, To God Be the Glory. Let me just again read a couple of those passages. I think sometimes we sing them, but we don't really meditate and think on what we're singing. But listen to what it says. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. Give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Great things he's taught us, great things he has done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see. Can you imagine what we're going to see when we get to see Jesus? What wonderful things God has done. What great things God has done. When you look at the creation and you see all the beauty in the sky, and you look up there and you see the orbs in space, those lights, and you see the beauty of the created order around us as we look at all the beautiful things and know that God created that for our enjoyment. God has done great things. But God is doing that in my life and in your life. We are a new creation. We are a beautiful creation. And you know, when God gets through creating us, you know what he's going to say? It is good. It is good. Because he's going to recreate us in the image of his dear sons. Great things he hath done. We're going to be looking at in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 3, a section here. In fact, John Phillips says about this, I quote, This section of the book of Ephesians introduces us to the unscalable heights and the unfathomable depths of the Christian life. The Bible contains no greater truths than those written here, end quote. There are some great truths in this passage we're going to be reading tonight. In fact, I don't think I'm going to get through with it, so I'm going to probably come back and look at some of it again next uh, Sunday morning as we have our great day of gathering, our, our high attendance day, some things that folks need to hear about what we have in Christ. But tonight we're going to talk about what God has done for us, the great things that God has done for us. Now before we stand to read this, Verse number three, and I know this will drive you English teachers crazy, but you talk about a run-on sentence or incomplete sentence. Verse number three, all the way down to verse 14 in the Greek, is the longest Greek sentence in all of Greek. Not just the New Testament, but all they can find in all of Greek. It is one sentence. Now, if your Bible's like mine, I have two periods in the midst of mine, but they're not there in the Greek. It's like Paul got started with what God has done for you and I, and he couldn't stop. He just kept writing. He just kept, he wouldn't put a period in it. He just, there's more. There's other things here that we need to, to consider as well. All the way from chapter 1, verse 3 to chapter 1, verse 14 is one complete thought, one complete sentence, or maybe you'd say incomplete sentence, a run-on sentence uh, that we have in the Greek language. So keeping that in mind, let's stand together. And I want you to notice in here the complete picture of the Godhead as he works out our salvation. All three, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are involved in what's going on in my life and I hope in your life in a unique way. Beginning verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to his good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved, in him 
we have the redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He has made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of his, uh, of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. It's all for the praise of his glory, of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. May God richly bless the read the scriptures. You may be seated. Now let me show you what God has done. Number one, the Father has brought us to salvation by his will. Right in your mind or on the page that you may be taking notes, the will of the Father. The will of the Father is that we might have relationship with Him. The key word here is relationship. God's desire is that none should perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God's desire is to have a relationship with you. The supreme relationship of God that He desires is that we have a fellowship with him, and a fellowship with his son. But he calls himself Father, the will of the Father. Did you know, this may surprise you, that of the 1144 references to, to Father in the Old Testament, your 39 Old Testament books, best I can count, there are 1144 references to Father. Only eight of them refer to God. It was almost an unheard of thing for the Jews to think of God as their father. The concept of God being a father scarcely appears in all the Old Testament. Never is he addressed in a prayer, which there are many prayers in the Old Testament, as our father, as father. The, the, the first mention of it is, by the way, in the last book of Moses. So there's five books of the Bible that pass by and at the very end or close to the end as he's moving to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, finally Moses makes a, a reference, a quick reference that God is our father. The psalmist, that's speaking of Davidic covenant, it's David who, who does this. He says of God, this I uh, quote, I have made a covenant with my chosen, that is David, and then skipping down a verse, he talks about that covenant in verse 26. He will cry to me, that is David, I've made this covenant with David, and he will cry this, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I also shall make him my firstborn, that is David, the highest of the kings of the earth, my loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him, so I will establish his descendants, now this is Jesus, that his descendants going to be Jesus, and his throne as the days of heaven. And so he's referred to as father. Only Moses, then David, and then Isaiah wrote this. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government will be on the, his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. What's the next thing? Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. That's all talking about future things. David one day will call me father. His descendants going to call me father. Israel's going to be able to call God father. And here he says there's one who's coming who's going to be known as the eternal or everlasting father. It's actually the third time it was used was in that passage. Now, I could go on and give you all of them, but I'm not going to do that. Isaiah also used this uh, again, in chapter 64, verse 8, when he said, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are the potter, and all of us the work of your hands. And only Jeremiah is the other place it's mentioned. 
two references in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 4, and also verse 19. But that's the only place it's mentioned. And, and Jeremiah's was very vague. And so eight times. Once by Moses, once by David, four times by Isaiah, and twice by Jeremiah. That's it. Out of the Old Testament, God was not looked at as a father, but as God. In fact, they knew him as Elohim, that is creator God, as Jehovah or Yahweh, which is covenant God, Adonai, which is just simply Lord, as El, which is just simply the generic word for God, or El Shaddai, Almighty God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, Jehovah Nishi, that is the Lord is our banner, Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, the Lord our peace, Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts, is what that interprets. And he uses several other names, but they never really talk about God as a father. But when Jesus came, Jesus spoke of him almost exclusively as father. In fact, in the New Testament, the word for father is pater, is used 413 times. 264 of that, well over half, are in reference to God as the father. Many of those, most of those, are from Jesus' lips himself. In fact, the Gospel of John, the last Gospel written, there was 124 references to God as Father. And so as we move into the New Testament, we see something unique. God moves from being creator God, covenant God. He's always that. He's always going to be that. He doesn't change. He's still that. But he begins to be looked at now in relationship. I have the privilege of being known as a child of God, as one of God's children, of being able to say, Abba, Father. In fact, can anybody tell me the first recorded words of Jesus in the Bible? It was when he was 12 years old. Can anybody tell me what it is? Know you not that I must be about my father's business. That's the first reference, that's the first words Jesus is recorded of having said in the New Testament. You better know what the last words are? Not it's finished, that was right before it. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In fact, in all the New Testament, you will not find Jesus refer to God as anything but Father except from the cross when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, why would he say it that, at that moment? Because the relationship with the Father and Son was severed because sin of the world had been placed upon Jesus and that relationship for a moment was severed as, as God turned his back upon his Son. The world grew dark at noonday and Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But every other reference from Jesus is my Father. They can't take you out of my father's hands. My father's house is to be a house of prayer. My father's, in my father's kingdom. He talks about the father over and over. Why? Because between the father and the son existed a relationship. And that is what God has done for you and I. He has brought us into that relationship. We now know him as father. Jesus taught us to pray our father who are in heaven. So when we pray, we're addressing God, not as creator, though he is that, not as savior, though he is that, not as Lord, he is that, and there's nothing wrong with calling him Lord, but we, co we come to him as relational, our Father who art in heaven. And the Father desires a relationship with us, and that is his will. In fact, it is said, choose us in, he, has, he says in this text, in verse number 4, He has chosen us, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame in Him in love. Then in verse 5, He's predestined us to adoption as sons, that is sons and daughters, by the way, it's generic, as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. He's adopted us. Now, that's not the only way we've been brought into the family. Did you know there's three ways that you were brought into the family? How is there three ways that you can have children? Number one, they'd be naturally born. So you're born into a family, and that person becomes my son or daughter. I've got five children that were born to me. I'm their father. They have a right to call me father. How else can you be brought into a family? Through marriage. Through marriage is another one. I, I, I have five 
sons and daughters by law or in law. Alex is my daughter by law because she's married into our family. Trevor is my son by law or in law. By the law, he is my son because he's a part of our family now. And I have three others that have married into our family. So by marriage. And the third one is how? Adoption. To be adopted into the family of God. I've got all three of those in the family of God. I was born again into the family of God. So I've been born into the family of God. I've married into the family of God. I'm engaged to Jesus Christ. Now the marriage supper hasn't taken place yet. But the, the covenant's already in place. And I'm already engaged if you will but actually married to Christ and therefore I've been brought in as a part of God's family through marriage but also adoption and one of the reasons why Paul would use adoption in this is that did you know that a Roman citizen could disinherit or kick out a natural son or daughter from his family because their reasoning was is maybe you had a child that you didn't intend to have or you had a child that grew up to or had disabilities or problems or issues or whatever and you didn't want that child you just got what you got through nature and therefore you could just abandon that child or you could just disown that child or you could disinherit that child but did you know by Roman law you could not do that with an adopted son or daughter you could not take away their inheritance and here was their reasoning because you knew when you adopted that child what you were getting When you adopted the child, you were saying, I know all about this child. I see who they become and what they are, and and I want them to be a part of my family. So you could not disinherit them. And so Paul was talking about, we've been brought into a relationship with God, and we have this relationship because that's the will of God. He knew I was going to become a part of the family before he ever created the, the earth. And he has predestined me to be a part of that family that I will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Everyone brought into the family is predestined to be like Jesus and to be a part of the family of God. And so therefore, we have this relationship uh, with him. He says in verse number six, we are accepted in the beloved and also we are given an inheritance. He says in verse number 11, according to the counsel of his will. I am a child of God. And one day I will receive the inheritance, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and so are you. So that's the will of the Father. Notice the work of the Son. He talks about that in verse 7 and 8. He talks about the word that Christ done. And the key word here is not necessarily relationship, though that's what it leads to. The relationship is with God the Father. I have a relationship with God the Father, but it's through Jesus the Son. And by the way, that's the only way you can get there. There's no other way you can have a relationship with God the Father. You can't come to the Father but by Jesus. There's no other name given among men where we can come to the Father and enter into this beautiful relationship, have the inheritance that God has promised, except through Jesus Christ. So the key word here is redemption. The redemption. In fact, this letter, as well as many of the letters of Paul, are filled with the accolades of Christ, of Jesus, what he has done. Ephesians particularly, because in Ephesians, almost every verse of chapter 1, you have the mention of Jesus. When you look through this, if you'll go through there, you'll find a pronoun or you'll find his name. You'll find almost every verse refers to Jesus Christ. In fact, there are 10 times he says in this text we read, verse 3 through 14, he talks about in Christ, in him, in the beloved, in whom we have these things. You get the idea that everything is dependent upon what Jesus Christ has done. When I entered into Christ through redemption, then I have relationship with the Father. And so it's in Christ that all these things come to pass. Though God has predestined, it's Christ who has provided my salvation. And it's in Christ alone that we find this salvation. And it's by his work on the cross. Notice verse 17 again. He says, we have redemption through his blood. And the word redemption means to purchase back or uh, to receive back. And it's through his blood. Again, there's only one way of salvation. And that is because Jesus Christ died on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. 
but through the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross, then we have forgiveness of sin, which will be number two in just a moment. But we have redemption, and we have the forgiveness of sin. Now, redemption, listen, redemption happened two ways in the Old Testament. There was the redemption that God brought about for the nation of Israel when he delivered them from the Egyptians. Now that was redemption by his power, and he'll talk about that often. By my own right hand, by my power, I have redeemed you from Egypt. Now he gave us a picture of the purchase, but it wasn't the purchase. When he allowed a lamb to be slaughtered, remember the Passover lamb? And that was a picture, but that didn't provide for their deliverance. What provided was power. But there was another way of redeeming something, and that was in the story of Boaz and Ruth. And that was through a purchase price, through a price that would be paid. So it could be by power or it could be by purchase that redemption comes about. Now, if it's Satan that holds you and I, and if, if the problem is that God has to pay Satan off, he has to purchase us and buy us back from Satan, then he can do that by his power. He just deliver us. But notice that when God delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage, he didn't, re he didn't release them from sin. They were just as sinful. In fact, they were completely gone astray many times. So God did not come to purchase us from Satan. It is God who has been offended. The purchase price is to God. The son paid the father. The wages of sin is death. It's God who has been offended. It's God who needs to be appeased. And so it's only through blood, never through power. Now, there's power in the cross. There's power in what God can do through mighty miracles and wonders. And Jesus demonstrated those mighty miracles and wonders. But it's only through the blood that the purchase of redemption can be made. It's never going to be of works. And he makes that very plain in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you're saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. So our redemption is in the hands of Jesus Christ through the blood which he shed on the cross. That's what God has done. God has brought us back into relationship with him. And he did it through the redemption brought about by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Then we have the witness of the Holy Spirit. So all three parts of the Trinity are involved in your redemption, in your salvation. We have the Father, and it's the will of the Father. We have the Son, and it's the redemption brought about by the purchase of the Son, by what the Son has done for us. But notice it's the witness of the Holy Spirit that is in us. Look at verse number 9. Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. So God has made known to us what is going on. How did he do that? Well, he stirred up your heart through the Holy Spirit. Now go down to verse 13. In him you also trusted, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom you have believed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, get this. The Father prophesied and the Father prepared and the Father predestined salvation. It's God's will. It's the Father's will. The Son provides it, but it's the Holy Spirit that presents it. Jesus, when he died on the cross, we think of Jesus dying on the cross, and therefore because Jesus died on the cross, we all get to go to heaven. Well, that's not true, or everyone's saved. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. That's very clear, 1 John. And there are people who teach universalism that because Jesus died and he cannot fail, and his blood is precious, everyone's going to heaven. No one's going to hell. Well, the Bible's very clear. That's not the case. What is the key to salvation? The key to salvation is that Jesus came from heaven to earth, lived among us a sinless life, and he says, I must go back to the Father so the Holy Spirit can come. Why? Jesus goes back to the Father, and he, if you will, he builds a bridge 
between heaven and earth. And on the cross, he was reaching out to the Father and on the, with one hand, and he was reaching out to mankind on the other hand. And he reconciled God and man together. He brought us together. But it's only those who receive the Holy Spirit of God who are saved. Even people who believe Jesus died on a cross aren't saved unless they receive the Holy Spirit of God. You see, it's the Holy Spirit of God that first of all enlightens us, helps us to understand. He convicts us of sin, of righteousness, the judgment come. He helps us to understand that which we need to know. And we call this revelation. That's the key word here. Not redemption, not relationship, but revelation. He reveals to us. He draws us. He woos us. And then, according to verse 13, he seals us. Now here's the key to Christianity. Most people think of Christianity is as a way to get us off the earth into heaven. No, Christianity is the opposite. Christianity is about the God of heaven coming and living in our hearts. Living inside us. That's salvation. Not just Jesus died, which he did for the whole world, but not the whole world saved. And God desires a relationship, but the only ones who have procured that relationship who have truly been redeemed or those who have received God's Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus put it this way, you must be born again. Then he goes into a talk with Nicodemus about the wind. You can't see the wind, you can't hear, I mean, you can't see the wind, but you can see the evidence of the wind. You can't uh, see the wind, but you can hear the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can feel the wind. And so, same is true about the Holy Spirit. I can't see the Holy Spirit, but I can hear, but I can see the evidence of what the Holy Spirit has done in my life. I can feel the Holy Spirit at work, and because of that, I am sealed until the day of redemption. Now, I've already been redeemed in my soul and my spirit, but one day my body will be redeemed. And so, I am sealed. He calls him here the great guarantor. In verse number 14, he's the guarantee of my inheritance. God has already given me a great inheritance, salvation. But really that salvation is because his son through the Holy Spirit lives in my heart. There's the great gift. What great things he has done. And he's done it all for his glory and for his honor. And through that also, he gives us assurance. It's the Holy Spirit that lets me know that I have a guarantee from God that his Holy Spirit that lives in me will continue to abide in me until the day of Jesus Christ. And so I can walk in this world as a child of God. I ought to sing praises. And everything I ought to do is for his glory and for his honor. That's what God has done in me. And do you count it a sacrifice to miss a Super Bowl and be here? Or a half of a Super Bowl? Why would anybody ever look at the things of this world as being precious? Well, we can talk about the wonderful salvation that Jesus Christ has provided for you and for me through the purchased blood of Jesus Christ. And we have been sealed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So I have relationship with God the Father through the redemption brought about through Jesus Christ, because the Holy Spirit has revealed himself unto me, has drawn me, and now I've received him into my life, and I've been born again by God's Spirit, who is the seal of my salvation and the guarantee that one day I'll be brought into the presence of God Almighty. Isn't that wonderful? That's what we have in Jesus Christ. But you must be born again. God has provided a gift for you, but you can reject it. For God loves you so very much that he gave you his only begotten son, that whoever will believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So you can either perish or have everlasting life, depending on what you do with God's great gift. Let us stand together. As we have a time of invitation, if you've not already done so, now would be a great time to give your heart and life to Jesus. But if you have been born again, maybe now is a time to rededicate, to completely devote ourselves unto Christ. Maybe you need to come and join this fellowship. You're just praying about a place where your spiritual gifts will be used by God and through the church in an appropriate way. If God has led you, you come.